welcome to eureka and uh, we are going to present you with a very special episode this episode is uh, about people who have won india's top post scientific award shanti swarup bhatnagar award the awards for the year 2020 have been announced and uh, we have with us the guest dr abhijit mugarji from the department of geology and geophysics of iit karakpur he has been awarded the shanti swarup bhatnagar award for this year and uh, on behalf of you and all of us we are uh, giving him our uh, best wishes and congratulations and uh, mm -hmm. let's start with this uh, first question uh, sir i mean one of the major area that you have been working on is uh, in the area of uh, ground water which is a very special area within the geophysics and uh, one of your major work which have been recognized by this award is your uh, decadal uh, uh, observations about the uh, ground water in india how the ground water situation has changed every 10 years so can you tell us about this uh, project some salient points sure so uh, you know india is the highest user of ground water across the world and yeah. in recent times uh, you know uh, india has been one of the most water stressed countries in the world okay. it's losing uh -huh. ground water in a hist historical high in human history mm -hmm. um so one of the study that i have been involved with my students for the last 10 years is okay. looking at the decadal scale groundwater storage change of india since mm -hmm. 1980s to to the present so what we have done is we have integrated data sets that was available from the ministry of water resources the then ministry of water resources now it's all shifted okay. along with um a nasa satellite mission called grace mission uh, okay. where we have been working in collaboration for last 10 years and we have I had a marriage of the two you know two uh, uh side of the story where we have the ground based data as well as the satellite based data and we have tried to integrate that to interpret how the ground water storage has been decreasing across india in the last almost 30 years so see this is where i want to ask you one small question i mean uh, one can understand uh, when you are talking about ground water it's something below the sub surface sub surface That's i cool. mean uh, a satellite will be able to take a picture of uh, uh, let's say surface water or a plant growth or maybe some disaster in a area how do you use a satellite to actually detect water uh, below the surface and then also okay. estimate its uh, uh, its amount from that right so basically the the way the philosophy works is that uh, earth's gravity is changing over like a uh, larger region uh, continuously and uh, the at uh, the principle as it goes is that if the gravity of a place is changing um uh -huh. on a very rapid time scale and unless there is a catastrophe that has happened uh, the okay. largest change is attributed to the change in water cycle now oh. if you can uh, estimate the surface water by other means by you know computing oh. another process then you can uh, link it up to the change in the groundwater storage of course the resolution is pretty coarse but you can still do it and you can actually literally uh, you know measure the groundwater storage change in a daily scale um, oh, oh, oh. yeah so uh, that's so, so, so cool. basically you are saying that suppose if there is a surface hmm. and uh, you are looking at one point and you are measuring the gravity there on a continuous time scale yes. if the gravity that changes it means that the uh, mass of that uh, let's say column there is a change and from that you make yes. a guess that Uh, what can change rapidly is only water i mean things can't change that's correct i mean unless i mean it's a huge building which has collapsed or something like that right I or mean, there is a catastrophe like an earthquake or a tsunami uh -huh, that has taken place okay. yes so so in a, in a normal basin where you don't experience a earthquake it's it's a one way of uh, that's correct uh, actually remote sensing water yeah it's a remote sensing technique yes absolutely okay. but very, very you know, interesting so yeah. uh, so yeah. how long you have been doing this project now so um Uh, we i i joined iit kharagpur last 10 years and for the last 9 years i've been doing that for sure um okay. and the collaboration is going on for last uh, yeah 8 9 years now so so uh, what what is the major finding that you have got out right. of this i mean uh, so, which part yeah. of the country that you have been uh, uh, observing what kind of changes are you looking uh, are we in for a, a big shock or are mm -hmm. we uh, good i mean uh, we would like to know what is the result of your uh, finding right. as of today right so so what uh, like when we started this work we had this kind of bias i would say that you know groundwater is the largest user sorry india is the largest user of groundwater across the world and uh -huh. india is drying out as the literature suggested so we started this study and we had some uh, very interesting observation 
while we saw that the groundwater is actually rapidly depleting in the Indus Ganges Brahmaputra basin, which is mm -hmm. you know the main uh, groundwater repository of the country, okay. we did see actually groundwater rejuvenation and replenishment in parts uh -huh. of southern India and western India. Okay. And this was an eye opener, and uh, actually we were not expecting this. So uh -huh. in 2017, when we published this paper, it got a lot of uh, you know attention. And um, I was called, you know, in the government of India, various ministries, and I did the presentation in all of them. And so it it showed that the replenishment that is happening in southern India and western India, mostly Gujarat and surrounding places, actually is related to certain groundwater conservation methods that they have been doing either in local scale or a regional scale, not always kind of aiming to do a groundwater conservation, but it uh -huh. eventually happened that way. Like you have the Jyotigram project in uh, Guzat, which was not typically aimed for groundwater rejuvenation, but the fallout was that there is a groundwater rejuvenation. So mm -hmm. this outcome really showed that if you, uh, you know, really engineer it, you can actually get a, a revival of the groundwater uh, resources of the country. And uh, eventually I think like it influenced uh, the, some of the present policies that the government is now taking, you know, to do a country scale artificial research. It, oh. uh, I believe, you know, my our study kind of influenced that in a big way. Okay, so 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 you are saying that uh, uh, it's a mixed picture. I mean, in some places uh, things are deteriorating, but some yes. places, thankfully, you see a, a turnaround. So, which gives That's us right. a hope that uh, if we actually have a good uh, groundwater policy, uh, yes. we may not lose the ground. That's what that's one of the major uh, 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 impact that you have. And also, yes. this also actually goes to prove some of the effort that we are taking is actually giving results, right? It does, but uh, here I'll uh, put a word of caution because the science has to be involved in this policy making. Now, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, in this country, uh, science sometimes takes a back seat when other priorities comes forth. And, uh, you know, when we proposed this work back in 2017, there was a lot, lot of appreciation on the science. But as I look through, I think the science is slowly kind of, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying. So that, so, that so, needs to be, yeah. That has to be brought in. So, so one of the major, as you are pointing out, one of the major uh, groundwater sources, actually the Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra uh, basin. I mean, these three uh, river systems are integrated and then uh, there is a kind of an integrated uh, groundwater system in India. And one of your okay. studies, you are also pointed out that 70% uh, of India's groundwater is in this region. But you have also That's pointed right. out that uh, uh, we'll be able to take out only 30% and if you take more than 30%, I mean, it's not uh, uh, advisable. Can you explain what it is? Actually? Yes, yes. So, you know, like uh, as of the estimate that we have, about 30% of the groundwater resource of the whole of India is uh -huh. kind of uh, focused in the Indus Ganges Brahmaputra Basin, which is also okay. the North Indian plains, you know, stretching mm -hmm. from Punjab, Haryana toward, uh, you know, SM and uh, the North Eastern states. Okay. And w the way it works, the science works, like groundwater... Um, although, you know, every, every year people see that there is an increase in groundwater level as the monsoon comes in, actually mm -hmm. the science doesn't work that way. The movement of groundwater in the subsurface is extremely slow, you know, few centimeters a year, that kind of a slow. And okay. what the change in level that you see, there are other physics, you know, physics involved practices or uh, uh, principles that actually influence the rise in the water level. So what okay. you're seeing is not exactly a real rise. Um, so, you know, so the word of caution here is that, um, you know, if you try to extract groundwater, you know, at various levels, you know, now mm -hmm. presently, much of the groundwater is getting extracted from a depth of about uh, 50 meter on down below. That groundwater okay. possibly got recharged at least a few thousand years back. So what oh. you are doing is actually taking out a fossil resource. Uh, and you are not going to get it uh, recharged, at least naturally, in, in the next few thousand years. So okay. if you take out the groundwater unsustainably, you know, without understanding what exactly is happening, uh, we can really dry out the country quite soon. So, so see, when we, when we talk about groundwater, I mean, uh, actually there are two layers, right? I mean, one layer, very, very deep, which is uh, what you can call as paleo water or something like that, which mm -hmm. generally uh, uh, our uh, normal uh, uh, way we are not uh, reaching. But whereas it's a, it's a more upper layer that we are talking about as groundwater, right? So mm -hmm. in the upper layer, how much time it takes actually for that water to get in and get stored? Uh, does it happen in every right. season or uh, it takes no, it quite a lot of time no. to uh, get that uh, over there? Right. 
So if, if you go beyond something like four or five meters, mm -hmm. uh, the water that you get are decade old. Okay, okay and okay. as you, okay. yeah. So, and as uh -huh. you go a few meters more, it possibly uh -huh. a few hundred years old. So if you oh. go to a depth of uh, 50 meters, you know, it's, you know, it's easily 10,000 years old. So uh -huh. when we're talking about paleo water, those are possibly a million years old. Uh -huh. So, you know, these are geologic phenomena, right? Going in the geologic time scale. And so the rise in the groundwater level that we see every year after the monsoon mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that there is a vertical flow path that is kind of rejuvenating the aquifers. There are other physics attributes which will influence it. So, so when uh, uh, in some places people go as deep as something like uh, uh, 200 feet to uh, get mm -hmm. the groundwater, you are talking about some historical time, water that has gone in there, historical yeah, time. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, so something like uh, yeah. our uh, great grandfather's time water that we are actually taking up and using. Uh, well, I would say like 200 feet is quite shallow, like, you know, like uh -huh. in uh, Bengal and Bihar area. <coughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. they are going for 300 meters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so 200 feet is like what, 75 meters, that kind of thing. So uh -huh. if we're looking at 100 meter even, the water can be easily like 10,000 years old. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. So, 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 so basically when, when, the, when the agriculture started, the water went there. I mean, that's what we are uh, taking if you are going like that. So right. in some Absolutely. sense, by uh, taking out the groundwater in a very unplanned manner, uh, uh, we we are uh, uh, in some sense spending away money which have been saved or other water which have been saved for generations. That's that's, that's one right. important that's point that comes great. out of it. Yes. So yeah. that's where we'll take a very short break. We'll uh, take okay. a very short break. Keep watching Reka. After this break, this very interesting conversation will go. Groundwater is a very important resource and a very important uh, area of concern. Keep watching Reka. After the break, we are going to talk about. What happens to Ganga? There is a report that it's uh, drying out in summers. So after a short break, we'll continue. Keep watching. Located in Old Goa, the Basilica of Bomb Jesus is one of the oldest churches in the state. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Basilica holds the mortal remains of St. Francis Xavier, a 16th century missionary and a pivotal figure in the spread of Christianity outside Europe. Bomb Jesus, literally meaning good or holy Jesus, is a term often used in the countries of Portuguese colonization. The construction work on the church began in 1594 and it was consecrated in May 1605. One of the oldest churches in Goa and in India has a marble floor inlaid with precious stones and the main altar holding a large statue of Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of Society of Jesus. Styled in Baroque and adorned with the figures of Christ and his apostles at the Last Supper, the altar table is used in Holy Mass. Nestled in the heart of Goa, the place is thronged by hundreds of tourists every day and is also a symbol of India's composite and secular identity. We are having a very wonderful, very enlightening conversation with Dr. Abhijit Mukherjee. He is Associate Professor of Department of Geology and Geophysics in IIT Kharagpur, and he is one of the uh, person who has been awarded with India's topmost scientific award, Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Award for the year 2020. So, after congratulating him, we would like to continue this conversation, sir. Uh, before the break, we were talking about. Some of your work uh, uh, related to groundwater, what kind of assessment that we are doing, how actually going as deep as something like about 100 meters, 200 meters, we are actually taking away water which has gone there about uh, thousands of years ago. So now let me shift to another question that one of the, uh, uh, let's say, very striking finding, in some sense shocking finding, is uh, the Ganges is drying up in certain season. So can you elaborate on this? Right. So... Um... You know, like uh, this is a finding that we had uh, 
published in 2018 and again like it did a lot of uh, uh, took a lot of attention so what we found out that uh, since 1970s with the starting of mm -hmm. the green revolution and a lot of groundwater pumping uh, the water the groundwater that keeps the ganges alive mm -hmm. actually has started decreasing now it's a kind of a misunderstanding to think like ganga is a glacier based river it does oh. be a glacier based river but only in the upstream areas so as you come closer to varanasi let's say uh, uh -huh. you know the glacier component goes down to more, no more than 20% it's it mostly the groundwater that keeps the river alive okay. at least uh -huh. in the non monsoon seasons uh -huh. so what happens is like it's like a mathematical equation right if you take out one part of the equation the other part kind of depletes so if you take out the groundwater by uh, all this irrigation and irrigation related activities um, mm -hmm. so you are literally cutting off the water that would uh, you know ideally go to keep the river alive so what we found out since 1970s to 2010 much of the parts of the river has got depleted and the, the river flow has actually gone down severely uh -huh. since 2010 the things have been even you know more worse mm -hmm. and certain parts of the Ganga, mostly in the downstream, like downstream in the eastern Bihar and uh, West Bengal areas, they have mm -hmm. been actually drying out, I and see. you can uh -huh. literally walk on the Ganga in few Whoa. of the days in the summer times. Uh -huh. You know, I have some pictures which are so striking, and you cannot even imagine it's the Ganga River we are looking at. And we, so you know, people have been talking about climate change and all these things, which might have some some uh, impact for sure. But what okay. we found out is actually is the depletion of the groundwater. Mm -hmm. in a in a broad sense which is actually also killing the ganga now mm -hmm. this is a study that we did on the ganga but our very you know broad reconnaissance study shows this is same story that is going for indus it is going for brahmaputra and all the major rivers which are kind of kept alive by the groundwater sources so most of the rivers across the country are actually drying out and uh -huh. we we don't understand the dynamics very well yet but they are drying out for sure after all the civilization uh, emerged on the banks of rivers and if the yes. rivers die out uh, i suppose uh, the civilization is under uh, great threat uh, uh, yeah. am i correct we are going for an extinction if we do uh, that yeah so now let me shift to another question i mean one of your major project another major project has been uh, looking at uh, uh, ganges brahmaputra basin groundwater basin yes, yes. so uh, uh, that study uh, uh, what are the main results that uh, we got out of it what are the new insights that we got out of it so uh, and i would also add indus now because i'm now also uh -huh. now in working in the place where the, you know all the disputes okay. are going on in in ladakh uh -huh. area so okay. i've been looking at the indus the ganges and the brahmaputra and uh -huh. what we are trying to find out how the groundwater and the river water are interacting so okay. i have been uh, supported by ministry of uh, earth sciences and the department of science and technology projects continuously okay. and mm -hmm. we are trying to determine how the groundwater is helping the river water and the river water in turn um, okay. is kind of supporting the groundwater so that study is going on and uh, as i said like in some places you know the, the there is an equilibrium that is maintained but in most places actually uh -huh. the groundwater input to the river is receding and consequently mm -hmm. the rivers are drying out Okay. now this is not just a physical phenomena there is also a chemical uh, component to it because as this the change in equilibrium happens the chemistry mm -hmm. of the water both at both ends both the river water and the ground water actually shifts and that okay. shift can actually result to a pollution of the river water or the ground water okay uh, depending on where you are and again like <clears throat> you know like most of the major rivers sorry major most of the major cities uh, mm -hmm. in north india are actually constituted on the bank of a river right you yeah. take uh, kanpur you take varanasi kolkata patna yeah that's right so these dynamics is extremely important even for the survival and the sustenance of these cities so we have a detailed study that we have been doing for the last 5 years in the city of varanasi and we are mm -hmm. trying to see like varanasi is one of the most ancient city in the world as well as mm -hmm. one of the you know dedicated future cities of the country and how you know the 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 uh, the equilibrium between the groundwater and river water might be able to sustain the river i'm sorry sustain the city the city of varanasi in a future times when the population possibly you know doubles and as you know the uh, our highest administration level has uh, now constituted the jal jeevan mission which talks about supplying clean drinking water to every household by the next four yeah. years and when you say clean water it means unpolluted water and as of today almost 80% or more 
of the drinking water of this country is actually, uh, you know, pinned down to the groundwater sources. Okay. So, okay. so when we say clean drinking water, it means also clean groundwater. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a lot of pollution in the groundwater, not necessarily always from human sources. There are, of course, pollution. But mm -hmm. actually, the natural state of the geological processes actually have resulted to pollution of the groundwater across the North Indian plains. And this, mm -hmm. this includes mostly on arsenic, which mm -hmm. kind of was first discovered in the Bengal area. But now we have been able to map it even in Bihar and UP in a large level, also in Haryana and Punjab. So much of the, you know, the North Indian plain, and of course, Assam, Assam and the East, North Eastern states. So much of the groundwater that we know that exists in, in, the, um, in the North Indian plains are actually polluted by natural sources. Now, arsenic, uh, if you drink arsenic for one day, two days, it's, it's a kind of colorless, odorless substance, mm -hmm. right? It's an element which uh, it's very difficult to detect. And, you know, in, in past times, it actually has been used for medicine even. Even today, like, you know, some of them, uh, you know. But when you take that arsenic in a dose higher than your body can live with, it will yeah. eventually result to development of cancer, cancer and gangrene and very severe uh, health issues. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to understand this interaction of the earth, on mm -hmm. of course water, and how the society is able to use this water. You know we are trying to understand the reason for the pollution in any place, and mm -hmm. you know very large scale to very local scale, and trying to understand the, how the society might be able to use that water in a sustainable and secured way, so that you know like uh, we can have a, a very secured and safe groundwater drinking water source for the future time. So if you say like, uh, what is one word uh, or a one line uh, contribution of your study, I would say like, I'm trying to secure the drinking water sources of the Indians for the next one generation at least. So uh, the arsenic study actually is attributed to finding safe drinking water, uh, you know, where they are. So that was, that was very interesting, but uh, uh, let's uh, shift to another point. I mean, I was looking at your uh, group's uh, motto. It uh, very clearly says, water, earth, and society. So you're also indicating as a group that uh, while your group will be working on uh, fundamental questions of science and understanding how the groundwater behaves, you also want to use that knowledge to uh, help society deal with its problem as of now. So from that angle, one of your major projects which has uh, received uh, uh, attention is related to the arsenic uh, pollution of groundwater, particularly in West Bengal, and how your work has impinged on the uh, uh, groundwater policy in that area. Can you uh, tell us about that? Right. So, um, you know, one of the very important aspects of the water is its uh, quality issues. And as of present, uh, you know, like uh, in this country, almost 80% of the drinking water is actually kind of related to groundwater. So oh. safety of the groundwater, the quality of safe groundwater is extremely important for the drinking water availability in this country. And as you know, like our highest administration has now uh, gone for the Jal Jeevan mission, which is mm -hmm. providing safe drinking water, clean drinking water to each Indian by next uh, four years. Oh. So the groundwater plays a very crucial role. Yeah. Um, so the science that we are trying to do is one of the science like one of the major contribution of that science is trying to figure out the ways in which we can get clean drinking water and clean groundwater actually. And uh, where are they available? And if they are not available, why are not they available? And what can be done to make it better? Um, so this is, you know, in a very nutshell, like what the arsenic research is about. Because okay. when you take arsenic in a higher dose in your body, like of course, uh -huh. dissolved in the water, that arsenic can actually lead to extremely difficult uh, health uh, concerns, including cancer and death. So millions of people have died over the world and mostly in India, so India and Bangladesh. So that's uh, really a concern for the future times too. Yeah, so so one of the recent uh, 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 progress that you have made or recent attempt that you have made is uh, use the state of art technology in your work. I mean, uh, okay. your, your group is one of the pioneers in uh, using artificial intelligence. That's to correct. understand about uh, the uh, groundwater, groundwater depletion, and what's happening to the groundwater. So right. how are you uh, actually building that? Uh, uh, yeah, quick uh, comment on that, would it be possible? Right. So in the, in the last 10 years, there's a huge amount of data that has been generated or have been available, both from the quantity as well as the quality of water. 
Oh. And this data have been kind of, uh, you know, hosted by most of the government agencies for oh. decades before oh. they were used, you know, for any purpose. Uh, what I am trying to do is, uh, you know, working in collaboration with some of the topmost computer scientists of this country, we are trying to develop this uh, algorithm and architecture where we can use that big data that is available from the government and mm -hmm. use it to find out some meaningful understanding of how the drinking water is available, the, where the water is available, why not, and so on. So the, the artificial intelligence work that we have just published, and we are actually working on a lot of them uh, in, in, the, in the very near future times, would possibly give out a much clearer picture how the water availability in this country would be uh, changing in you know very short time in future, as well as in a longer term future. Which changes in a wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a very important area, and uh, using state of art, having a better uh, a better use of the data is uh, something that uh, we should be looking forward to. And lastly, we, we don't have much time, but uh, I want to ask you this particular question. Uh, certainly, before we wind up this program, is how did you feel when uh, you came to know that you have been awarded this prestigious award, Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award, for this year? Um, yeah, it was absolutely a pleasant uh, uh, surprise as well as a delight. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I you know thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, not only that I enjoyed it myself, but it was also kind of a recognition of the subject and the science that I work on. And although you know people have been talking about water in this country for quite a while, this is the first time that in any discipline, any 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 expert on groundwater sciences and water sciences, very broadly, yeah. have been awarded this award. So I would take it just not an award as personally, but also as a discipline itself. That's a, so that's I, a very, really very interesting yeah. point. And I think a very important that point you are making that uh, water is an important challenge for us. And by uh, this award for you and for the field that you represent, yes. uh, we are also highlighting the importance of that in uh, uh, our contemporary uh, society. For want of time, we need to end our conversation here. Thank you for being with us. Once again, congratulations for this award. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, uh, we look forward to people like you coming up with uh, uh, solutions to challenges that uh, India is facing so that India can progress. Thank you for Thank being you. in the show. Keep Thank watching, you. Rekha. We'll come back with another conversation next week, same time.